If you've had cause to check the time while waiting for your tube train, you may have noticed these clocks. They can be found on quite a few underground stations. And if you look closely, you may have noticed that they were made by the Self-Winding Clock Company of New York. So, who are the Self-Winding Clock Company, how did their clocks end up here, and most importantly of all, what exactly is a self-winding clock? The clocks can be found on the Bakerloo, Piccadilly, Northern and District lines. And that's because they're a relic of Underground Electric Railways of London, who owned all four of those lines in the early 20th century. Well, sort of. It's complicated. UERL was a company with a very heavy American influence. It had been started by the Chicago businessman Charles Yerkes, and many of his staff were recruited either from America or from companies that had embraced American business methods. As you might expect of Edwardian Britain, the press were somewhat concerned that London was seemingly gaining an American transport network. But UERL assured them that they would be using British equipment as far as possible. Now, I don't know if they were telling the truth there, but what I do know is that they did buy a lot of stuff from America. In the case of the self-winding clocks, these were a patented device produced by a single company. So why these clocks? Well, efficiency. Efficiency was baked into everything UERL did. They were always seeking new innovations to speed things up and avoid wasted time. With a conventional clock, it has to be wound every so often, which isn't an easy job when your clock is well above head height and your station platform is busy. The self-winding clock didn't need that because, as the name implies, it wound itself. In essence, the mechanism of the clocks was standard clockwork, but they incorporated an electromagnetic device, which is how they were wound. It was all rather clever. What would happen was this. When the spring began to wind down, it caused two electrical contacts to be brought together. That triggered a solenoid, which used a ratchet to wind the spring back up. Another version did this automatically every hour. The power came from a 2-volt battery. The problem was that the underground was also electric, and it was feared that power fluctuations on the line might be picked up by the electromagnet. Now, I don't know how legitimate that fear was, I know basically nothing about electricity other than you shouldn't put it in your mouth. But regardless, the clocks also incorporated a device that could be remotely triggered, which would swing the minute hand back to 12. This meant that the time could be reset. This was, therefore, a clock that required very minimal human intervention. The only thing it couldn't cope with was British summertime. It was fine with the clocks going back, it had a setting that would continuously trigger the reset mechanism for an hour. But going forwards, the staff would still have to mess around with ladders to move the hands on. The clock was invented by one Henry Chester Pond of New York. Initially, all his company manufactured was the self-winding bit. But his invention proved so popular that he commissioned factories to build the entire clock for him. The underground alone ordered over 600. The reset mechanism wasn't his idea, but his company bought the patent out. And that brings us back to the present day. Given how many of the clocks survive in service over a hundred years later, they're clearly a pretty decent invention. They're even compatible with modern batteries. And that's time. Well, I hope you enjoyed this self-winding tale from the tube. If so, please do click the like button and perhaps subscribe for more. I'd like to thank my donors on Ko-fi and Patreon and here on YouTube for your ever-generous support. You are the solenoid to my ratchet. And I'll see you all again very soon for another tale from the tube.